And um, uh, so we're talking men, women, children, mostly children, <laughs> a lot of women, uh, black Americans, white Americans, not so many Native Americans because the Native American population was pretty depleted in the uh, turn of the last century in this area, but in the uh, Indian Territory in the Kayamishi and, and uh, there's another Illinois River over there, they were um, looking for pearls too. The, there are lots of, lots of different equipment um, and this is uh, called a water telescope. It's got a um, uh, plastic, I don't know, actually this one has a plastic um, cover at the bottom. And so you just push it down into the water and, and you can see um, there were other uh, pieces of equipment. Um, let me, let me, well, okay, I, I'm getting to the equipment in just a minute. Anyway, uh, there were some, there were some professional purlers as well. Uh, for instance, there were two women who purled um, five months a year in different Arkansas rivers, and they reported that they made about $300 every summer season on uh, pearl sales in uh, 1915 and 1916 from the Buffalo River in Arkansas and a, and a couple of other rivers. All right, well, what was the value of these pearls? You've already gotten an idea that there's some, some pretty valuable pearls. In, uh, in Arkansas in 1919, there was one pearl that sold for $1,650 off of the Black River. In the Wabash River uh, in, in the 1890s, there were hundreds of pearls that sold for anywhere from $500 to $1,000 a piece. Um, one buyer reported from the Wabash, he reported that he hoped to resell a pearl that he had bought for $50,000. And they're selling these pearls to Tiffany's and, and other you know, expensive high-end New York City um, uh, jewelers. In 1905, um, the peak year of pearl buying on the Wabash, $320,000 in pearl sales happened. Um, in 1906, it, it's possible to calculate that pearl sales from the, um, from the Wabash alone, in, that's the border between Indiana and, and uh, Illinois, that pearl sales alone were, was greater than zinc, gold, silver, gas, oil, copper, and utilities combined as investments. Um, just a little more information here. In one week on the Wabash, $7,000 worth of pearls in 1909. Um, black pearls were extremely rare, and one of them sold for $1,250. We're talking 1909, and, and there are pearl sales I showed you there on the Black River, $370,000 worth of pearls. Well, who were these pearl buyers? Some of them were local people, local Illinois, local Arkansas. Uh, usually, you know, they had to have capital to start with. So typically you come across doctors um, who are out buying pearls for, on Sundays from people. But there were also a lot of foreign professional pearl buyers, as I was saying. Uh, Sam Hendrickson of Clinton, Tennessee was buying pearls on the Wabash in the 1890s. And Clinton is just over, it's north of um, Knoxville. It's between Boone and Knoxville. He was buying pearls in Arkansas in 1919. So he was buying pearls for 20 years from, from uh, uh, this Eastern Tennessee buyer. Foreign buyers are recorded in newspaper articles from Budapest, Belgium, England, France, and Spain. The French were buying slugs or really misshapen junky things that you wouldn't really call a pearl. Um, they were buying pearly slugs for facial powder production. And then uh, the Chinese buyers were buying for medicinal purposes. So they're not buying the beautiful round pearls, they're buying the, the junky stuff. Um, 
um, a Mr. Brower of New York City is a reportedly killed himself when he couldn't sell $800,000 worth of Wabash pearls that he had bought over a four year period. These foreign buyers were frequently outmaneuvered by the American buyers. Um, language was part of the problem, um, knowing the countryside uh, so that they could go meet the, the perlers in, in remote areas as opposed to waiting in a hotel uh, or a bank lobby to make a sale. Um, okay, the, the, just one second. All right, the impact of pearl sales, you can imagine then was fairly significant. If it's, if the proceeds are exceeding all those other extractive industries, um, it's really quite, quite significant. Um, and fortunes were made with freshwater pearls. And I think they have a large, very unrecognized role in the capitalization of rural America, particularly in the Appalachian portion of Tennessee and the Ozarks of Arkansas from 1870 all the way to 1930. A Dr. Myers of Arkansas was quoted in 1904 as saying, I know of hundreds of families now living in neat little homes of their own out of debt and money in the bank as the result of pearling. So what's going on here in the clinch in the Holston of Eastern Tennessee? You see the clinch here and the Holston. Boone is right here. Here's Johnson City and Kingsport. Um, after 1894, the Clinch becomes the major purling river in Tennessee, and uh, it's and it's very active. Uh, yeah, the the idea of a pearl rush can be applied to the Clinch beginning around 1907. And I want to read you um, just a quick little uh, excerpt here. The uh, earliest record found of Clinch uh, River sales was a Mr. Lafayette Hutchison selling pearls in 1907 in Knoxville. Along the Clinch River, and this is a newspaper report here, along the Clinch River, the past season has witnessed all the incidents of the first excitement of pearl rushing and quite vivid and picturesque accounts were published of hosts of people camping along the streams, some in tents, some in the roughest shanties and some going from shoal to shoal in rudely built houseboats. Many pearls are reported as having brought $100 or more. The hunters are described as a lively, free, and easy set of people working hard all day, subsisting a good deal on fish caught in the river, and dancing all night to the banjo around campfires that line the banks of the clinch. <clears throat> Um, in 1909, the government sent a, um, a shell expert named John Beppel to the Clinch and the Holston to assay the, the quality of the shell for its potential in shell button production. And um, Perlers, Beppel reported that perlers were very active on both of these rivers, but they were completely ignorant of the market value of the shells themselves. Uh, again, I'd say that they, um, uh, they discard the shells. You know, they're hand harvesting, um, wading, sticking their heads underwater, uh, pulling up or using their feet to feel the, the, shell, the mollusk and then reaching down and pulling them up. So it's a fairly slow way to comb a riverbed and um, uh, discarding the shells and probably usually discarding the meats as well. Beppel instructed the pearlers as to the market value for the shells. And in 1912, uh, it's reported in the newspaper that there were 98 tons of Holston River shells sold to button factories in Muscatine, Iowa. And I'm getting there in just a minute. Beppel viewed the uh, pearl collection of a Knoxville jeweler 
And he learned that almost all of these pearls that the jeweler had and was selling to New York City had come from the Clinch River. Well, I'll, I've told you a little bit about the equipment they're using in the pearling. Um, in addition to hands, uh, very, innovation, very innovative um, equipment such as these hand rakes um, were used also. Another thing that we read about occasionally are farmers who take their teams uh, into the river and actually plow the riverbed so that they can then bend over and scoop up the, uh, the, the loosened uh, mollusks. Well, then there are several things that have led to the demise of the natural pearl and particularly the American natural pearl. You're probably familiar with um, Tahiti pearls and Japanese pearling. Maybe you're even familiar with Argentinian pearling. Um, all those natural marine uh, mussels only, are only found in, in two, well, two genera of uh, shellfish. So you've, that's why it's such a localized industry. The, the new, the greater demand for shell, it required an exponential increase in the harvesting of shellfish from the rivers. And in order to sell the shell, they had to get to the button industry. They had to get the meat out of this, out of the animal. So they were just taking, uh, you know, pounds and pounds and pounds of living shellfish from the rivers and dumping them into these big hot vats and steaming them open and then cleaning the meat out. And that was not conducive to the, the handling required of finding pearls. Um, most of the button, the musclers who muscled for the button industry, you know, were not interested in pearls. They could make as much money and more money by um, harvesting tons of shell than they could by going through very slowly individual mussels. Um, the other thing is that Japan starts artificially culturing pearls in 1919. And so by 1950, there's very little market left for natural pearls. Um, you know, there's, there's still the Tahitian pearl industry that they can get natural pearls, the dark pearls from in particular. And then the Japanese are culturing beautifully, perfectly round, or they're marketing the perfectly round pearls that they can get out by the dozens and the hundreds from their pearl farms. So certainly by 1960, the American natural pearl uh, industry was dead. Um, it ends in Venezuela uh, in 1966 as well. And now pretty much you have, uh, uh, you have the Japanese cultured pearl industry, which I'm gonna get to here in a minute. Uh, and then you've got the uh, Tahitian and that's about it for natural pearls. Well, at the same time, the uh, Japanese basically killed <laughs> the US pearl industry. There came a new demand for um, shells and that was uh, our own shell button industry. So this is a mollusk shell that's been drilled for different size button blanks. Um, there are early reports of efforts to start a freshwater or even a marine uh, shell button industry. And we get then a uh, small marine shell button industry in New Jersey and New York in the middle 1800s. The, um, in 1802, there's a report of freshwater shells being cut from several uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania rivers but that didn't go anywhere. And then there's also a report in Knoxville in 1883, there was an attempt to use freshwater shell to um, create a shell button industry, but competition from Europe um, just, just made it impossible for that to succeed. Um, that was until 
1891. There was a uh, button maker in uh, Germany named John Beppel. You've already heard his name in connection to the clinch in the Holston, but this is before that. Um, he oh, cut buttons in Hamburg and uh, then moved to Odessen, Germany. And somewhere in the 1880s, a box of Illinois River shells was sent to his father, who was also a, a button guild <coughs> member. And um, he inherited that when his father died and he kept it in his shop, just sort of thinking about these um, freshwater shells in, the, uh, in, in America. And you can see here in this photo that he's been cutting buttons out of horn. This is uh, African, an African animal horn. He's also got two very large uh, uh, pinctata pearl oyster shells up here on his bench that he's cutting uh, buttons out of as well. He cut wood buttons, horn buttons, and there were button guilds in, in all of these German and uh, the Austrian room? cities. They, um, they used European freshwater shell until, they, until the um, uh, freshwater molluscan population uh, got so denuded um, that they were having to uh, turn to other materials. So a, um, a, a tariff was passed in Germany that made it extremely difficult for German button cutters to sell their product. And um, at the same time, Beppel's wife died. He had this box of American shells on his, in his um, workshop and he packed it all up and moved to the US looking for the source of those shells. All he knew was that it was 200 miles west of Chicago. Um, by 1887, he um, was at his uh, sister's, at one of his sister's houses in uh, Illinois, and he uh, was combing the rivers around her town. He found usable shell in Petersburg, Illinois, uh, in the Illinois River, and then he kept on going. He found usable shell in the Mississippi River at Muscatine, Iowa, and then he found a really good shell, he thought, for button cutting in the Iowa River. He gathered five tons of washboards uh, while he was learning English, and he sold um, about $200 worth of pearls from the Iowa River collection. Well, as tariffs had hurt him in Germany, the McKinley Tariff uh, in 1889 helped the U.S. button industry, and he um, immediately formed a business enterprise with two partners in Muscatine, Iowa, and began cutting buttons from Mississippi and Iowa River shells there in Muscatine in 1891. Um, that partnership dissolved in 1892, so he went out on his own. In 1894, he was employing 150 button cutters and facers in Muscatine. Competition was so fierce by 1904 in the Muscatine area that he um, got into this huge lawsuit with his former partners, lost the right to use his own name um, for his factory. And um, after uh, 1913, he became a shell inspector for the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. And that's then in, in uh, 1912 is when he's dispatched to the Clint and the Holston and educates the pearlers there about the commercial value of the shell. While he was on that trip to the Clinch, he cut his foot on a, um, on a muscle and developed gangrene. He died uh, January 30th, 1912 in Muscatine, 11 years after founding the industry that would last until the 1950s. So these are the major rivers in the Mississippi watershed that were muscled between 1891 
and 1950 for the freshwater shell button industry. And you'll see none of them in North Carolina. There were some shells shipped from um, around uh, the Triangle area to Muscatine and Muscatine, Iowa is right here. Um, so it's on the right on the Mississippi River. Um, and then the Iowa River is right here where he was getting a lot of his buttons. Um, they, they were determined uh, to be unusable. Here you see a scene on the Cumberland River in Tennessee of uh, shells that are, have been cooked out and are awaiting shipment uh, to Muscatine. So this was the standard way the, sh the button industry worked is that um, buyers from the factories in Muscatine would go, would spread throughout the Mississippi watershed and put in orders. They would determine what sections of rivers uh, would be productive in any one season and then put in orders with um, one or two point people and say, okay, I want 50 tons, I want 14 tons, uh, and say, I want 50 tons of fat mucket. Um, I want 14 tons of yellow slipper shell. And, and then these guys would uh, harvest those, cook them out and wait uh, on the riverbank for the, in, for the factories barge to come by and pick them up or they would load them onto railroad cars uh, and, and ship them. The major way that uh, shells were harvested for the button industry, as well as the major way they are still harvested today in the few states that still allow this, is with these crowfoot hooks. And these John boats then have these long um, rails and there are chains hanging and each chain has six or seven crowfoot hooks on, or, or more. And this is what a crowfoot hook looks like. If you remember, the animals are gaping in the water. And when a hook comes across and touches the mantle, the animal clamps up on it. So here you lift the uh, rail and you see the muscles that have clamped on the hooks that were dragged along the bottom of the river. This is how French loggers harvested shellfish. It's probably also how Native Americans harvested shellfish from behind canoes, dragging willow branches uh, over the river bottom behind them. And then the mussels clamp up, you lift up the, the branch and, and clean the mussels off into your boat. Um, they also dredged on major rivers. And this is a, a, a shell dredge right here. And then these all have to be cooked out. They've got, they're live animals. And so they've got to be cooked out. The meat's got to be pulled out and discarded somehow. And then they're transferred onto this barge here for transport to a muscatine button factory. Um, these, this boat is um, a floating dormitory for um, this buttoning enterprise. Senator, can you hand me a piece of paper and a pencil? In some places, um, the rail infrastructure was so poorly developed, such as the Arkansas Ozarks, that they uh, went ahead and did the cutting of the button blanks at Riverside um, and uh, then just shipped blanks the um, Again, they're using these techniques as well. They're also ice fishing. They're cutting holes in um, the ice and um, sticking these long rakes down in Wisconsin and Michigan and harvesting shellfish that way too. Well, what are the characteristics of a good button shell? It has a completely white knacker. Um, you know, the, the colored knacker made for really interesting and high priced pearls, but but they didn't make for good buttons. Um, the the ready-made clothing industry wanted white buttons. So it, had a, it needed to have a completely white knacker. It needed to be very smooth, no blister pearls on the inside. It needed to have as smooth a possible exterior as well. So the washboards that have that, that ridging on the back were not particularly good um, 
uh, button shells. In the beginning, they could be picky. Later in the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, they're, they're taking even low quality shells. It needed to have subtle umbones, umbos so that not too much of the shell is wasted by the tooth and the umbo and a flat oval shape large enough to yield enough button blanks to bother with. So different size dies are being used to cut different size button blanks. And you see here's the exterior surface uh, on some of these button blanks and then this is the interior surface on, on other blanks. At the button factory, the factory has orders for different sized buttons. So they prefer to do the cutting of the shell in the muscatine factories so that they can fill these orders um, appropriately rather than have the guys cut the shells at the riverside and send the blanks. Um, again, looking at the um, at the uh, clinch and the Holston, let me just quickly read you um, something about, uh, about the clinch and the Holston. By 1910, several carloads were collected and sold for the button manufacture from the clinch. And that's, that's this river right here. During the season of 1912, the search for shells is being pursued with greater vigor, even up to the headwaters of the rivers in the Appalachians, and it's expected that larger shipments will be made. Sam Hendrickson, who'd been buying pearls and was from Clinton, Tennessee, which is, uh, where'd my cursor go? Um, which is right up in here in Tennessee. He'd been buying in the Wabash, he'd been buying in Arkansas. He's also then the first one to ship shells to the button industry. Uh, later that summer, his son Roscoe had a group of men gathering Clinch River shells. A 1912 federal assay of the river reported 50 tons of Clinch River shells marketed that year. The Anderson County newspaper ran the following ad in, on 23rd of August, 1913. Muscle shells, we will pay $14 per ton for muscle shells delivered Clint to Clinton suitable for making buttons, write the Knoxville Shell Company, and it gives an address for it. Um, Sam Hendrickson, the native of Clinton, made his living in real estate nine months a year, and then in the summers he was pearl buying and then now shelling. Each summer, Mrs. Bessie Mae Hendrickson his mother, Sam, the other family members, such as son Roscoe, and hired cooks moved on to the family riverboat, the Bessie May, from which they directed shelling activities. Local Clinton boys, a few Oliver Springs boys, and several adult black men uh, helped form a crew often as large as 100 or 150 people camped on the riverbank near the houseboat. And here's a picture of them. Um, uh, they camped on the riverbank near the houseboat, muscled all day, cooked out, and sold the shells and pearls to Sam Hendrickson. Mr. Hendrickson stockpiled an entire season's shells, then shipped them out on the Southern Railroad. At some point, Mr. Hendrickson began shipping the Clinch River shells to McKee Button Company and became close friends with McKee, the president. During the season of 1920, the Hendrickson houseboat was located near Lone Mountain. The local paper recorded much optimism about the enterprise. So the Anderson County News says, the Hendrickson brothers are dealing extensively in mussel shells, having nearly a hundred men employed in digging them from the clinch. The shells are shipped north and made into pearl buttons. It's possible the traffic may justify a button plant being located here later. Well, no button blank shop was ever built on the clinch. Muscling ended shortly after the closing of the last gate on Norris Dam in 1935, which was upstream from Clinton. With the silt, lack of dissolved oxygen and cold water combining to kill off most of the muscle population. 
The predictions that the dam would ruin the mussel population of the Clinch River proved to be true for the river downstream from the dam, but false for the river upstream from the dam. In 1971, malacologist David Stansberry of Ohio State University could say that the Clinch River is the richest tributary for mussels in North America. It is, in my opinion, the best preserved of all streams above Norris Reservoir. By setting aside this reach of the river, you'll probably ensure preservation in excess of 40 species. Although pollution made serious inroads into this population before Stansbury advice was followed, today the Upper Clinch River is a mussel sanctuary. Well, here you see uh, the transport uh, on the um, Cumberland River of shells uh, to the Mississippi and thence on to Muscatine, Iowa. Here we are in Muscatine. Uh, this is one factory, one pile, one photograph, one year of shells. And there's a guy on top of that. I don't know if you can see that. I can't. Um, oh, of these, these are shells that are waiting, awaiting processing. In order to process the shells, they all have to be soaked again to make them as soft as possible for cutting, which is not very soft. Beppel tried to modify marine shell equip button equipment from New Jersey and New York, and, and the marine shell is much easier to cut than freshwater shell is. And so they had to completely uh, devise new equipment for cutting these freshwater shells soaking them before they start to cutting, cutting them was an important step in it. So here we are in Muscatine. This is a factory cutting room. Um, the cutters are always male in this industry. In 1897, a, a 24 line count, uh, a 24 line button, which is something that you would put on a, uh, a men's shirt, um, paid 8.5 cents per gross cut. In 1919, that same 24 line button was uh, earning 11.3 cents per gross cut. So they're using the, the model of uh, piece, piece work here. Um, here's an, another uh, completely factory. off. I did what you said, and I had written this down. Another factory um, cutting. And I got it. In, uh, in 1897, a 26 line button was the largest cut. Um, and in, 18, in 1919, a 40 line, a 40 line button would go on a coat, <laughs> an overcoat. Um, so I'll just quickly show you a cleaning machine, classifying machines that would drop them into different size buttons. You see the buckets under there to catch the different button sizes that are falling out of different holes. Um, women were then uh, employed to do the drilling, run the drilling and the facing machines. In 1897, uh, you would earn three point, a woman would earn 3.5 cents per gross in cutting a four hole button. And then the buttons have to be sorted. Again, women are used for that and they are carded. Uh, and again, women are sitting sewing buttons onto cardboard cards. I guess while I'm listening to this. Uh, could you please mute could. yourself while you're listening to this? Um, here are button, uh, carded buttons. So you're all familiar with these. You saw these in your, in your youth. Um, what caused the end of shell buttons? It's the Japanese again. In the 1999, in the 1910s, um, the Japanese started mass producing plastic buttons cut from sheet, uh, sheet plastic. The problem with natural shell buttons was that washing machines would yellow them and crank dryers, you know, where you would crank the clothing through a crank and squeeze the water out of it, busted the shells. So the, the other thing is, as, um, as different lesser good quality, lesser quality shell species were used, there was greater wastage. And so by 1940, there was probably more wasted shell and unsold button than there was new shell and sold buttons. Um, 
they could not compete with the Japanese um, plastic buttons that were flooding the market and tariffs were uh, quite um, uh, contrary to the US button industry and quite positive for the Japanese button exports. Well, so the shell button industry in the US is dead by 1955 or so. Once again, Japanese killed it, but the Japanese are gonna save muscling because the cultured pearl um, is, uh, you know, I said that a pearl forms around an irritant. You get um, these Japanese inventors who um, realized that they could take a, a pearl oyster and implant some kind of irritant, a nucleus, into the soft tissue, and that pearl oyster would form a pearl around it. And the most successful of these Japanese inventors was Mikimoto, and he found that freshwater shell, a, a bead, a freshwater shell was the best thing to implant into a pearl oyster around which the animal could then deposit knacker and create a cultured pearl. So here you see the mantle extended. They harvested these shells, wedged them open, inserted a cube or a, or a pearl size uh, piece of freshwater shell into that mantle, let the animal uh, be, return the animal to the water and harvested it seven years later to get a pearl. Well, so in World War II, we had a couple of Tennessee and Mississippi River shellers who were uh, in the army in Japan who talked to Japanese prisoners of war and learned about the cultured pearl industry and their need for freshwater shell. They were using Japanese and, and mostly Chinese freshwater shell to make these nucleus, these nuclei. And these, um, particularly John Latandra of Western Tennessee said, well, I've been muscling for years. There's no market anymore for my shell, but I can provide you Japanese cultured pearl industry with all the nuclei you want. And so starting in 1950, the um, shell ceases to go to Muscatine. Six buyers are working uh, in, when I start doing my research in 1988, 1989, we've got six Mississippi River and Tennessee River buyers um, who are shipping shell directly to the Japanese cultured pearl farms for them to be tumbled, cut and tumbled and um, inserted into the cultured pearls, into the mussels, uh, the, the marine mussels to form these cultured pearls. So again, you've got to cook them out and then sort them into good ones and bad ones uh, and then ship them to Japan. So the, the round pearl is has been the best seller. It's been the standard for the jewelry industry. The US has been the number one pearl buyer since the 1920s. More often than not, a natural pearl or a freshwater pearl is called, a, it is lumpy, it's not round. And these are called Baroque pearls. So, Along with the cultured pearl, the Japanese perfectly round cultured pearl, they began to create an appetite in the US for the lumpy Baroque pearl. Today, because of pollution around Japan, and it's got to be polluted in China at this point too, um, the, the cultured pearl industry moved to freshwater shell in rivers of China. And China today produces most of the cultured freshwater pearls, but they're Baroques, they're not rounds. They're Baroques and they're produced by only two species. So it's a very um, ecologically fragile industry. Um, 
But what you do is you harvest the freshwater animal, you prick the mantle, and everywhere you prick the mantle, the creature itself, you don't have to put a nucleus in it. Uh, you can prick it a hundred times and you close the animal back up, put it back in the water, wait two or three years, and you're going to have a hundred little Baroque pearls in there the next time you open it. This is a Baroque pearl. Um, you, some of you may own uh, jewelry with Baroque pearls. Probably all of us own something. So they no longer need a shell nucleus. The round, if you want a perfect round, you've got to have a nucleus. But if you're happy with the Baroques, you don't need a nucleus. And you can farm these in not only China, but Latandra came back from World War II and he said, I'm not only going to ship shell from the Tennessee River to Japan, I'm going to start culturing pearls right here in the Tennessee River in Tennessee. So a man who reportedly hated the Japanese, I mean, by his own report, I've interviewed him a couple of times, by his own report, he hated the Japanese. He changed his tune by 1955. He went back to Japan, married a woman who worked in Mikimoto's factory, who you see here in the uh, foreground. And the two of them have been culturing pearls in, Eastern, in Western Tennessee. Um, they now produce about one fifth of the world's, of the US cultured pearl market. Um, this is a Japanese, I mean, Chinese cultured pearl farm, uh, but this looks very much like Birdsong uh, Farm. If you go over to uh, Birdsong Reservoir uh, on the Tennessee, in Western Tennessee, you can visit their farm. So this is what they're producing a lot of, uh, these Baroque pearls, and um, probably is spelling the end of any need for muscling. They just harvest they pull up these live animals, put them in cages, prick the mantles, keep dipping them back down and pulling them back up. When they harvest the, sh the pearls from them, they kill the animal. But it's a very, um, you know, it, it's nowhere near the kind of muscling uh, industry that it, that it had been in the previous uh, 120 years. So that is the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Carol, I was just going to point out about the national that in that little article that I just laid down beside you about the national. The Sorry. National Pearl Button Museum in Muscatine, <laughs> Iowa. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, Gail. Roger, you can speak with your question. Okay. Um, I can remember as a little kid, uh, and this would have been in the 1950s, going to the Mississippi River uh, with my mother and going to that museum and, and, and uh, playing on top of the big shell piles and they had all the holes in them and so forth. And that was very memorable for me. They were, it was just a huge, huge mound uh, of those uh, shells. And my question though is about McGregor, Iowa. Was there ever a button factory in McGregor, Iowa? What river is it on? It's on the Mississippi, but it would be farther to the north. Um, there could well have been a, a cutting works where they're cutting the, you know, cutting the blanks and sending them on. And there was a lot of competition. I suspect there was a, a pretty short term history of, of attempts at producing the whole, the whole process in lots of different places along the Mississippi that just probably had pretty short use lives. But okay, so you, you were, you were going over to Muscatine when you were a kid? Well, I, you know, before you, before you um, gave your talk, I thought it was McGregor, but it could have been Muscatine. I, I, um, 
I do remember a button, the button factory was right next door. It was a big limestone brick building and then all these piles of shells around. I don't know if there was a button museum there at that time or not. Because uh -huh. I would have, this would have been in the late 1950s. Yeah. In 1913, um, the U.S. produced $7,500,000 worth of button exports. And then in 1958, we're down to 3 million. So it's, you know, it's just in half. Um, I went from 25 million buttons exported to only 2 million buttons exported. Hmm. Uh, any other questions? Unmute. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Quail has a question. So Cheryl, did the uh, the switch from shoelaces from shoe buttons have anything to do with uh, the decline of the button industry? Not not too much. Um, you know, the lace up the button shoe uh, was over. Wasn't I think that was probably over by 1935 or 1940. Okay. Um, shoe buttons are just little teeny tiny things. Right. And you know the shank is almost as big as the button. <laughs> right. Um, so I don't think there was a lot of. There was one factory in Muscatine that I think actually filled shoe button orders, and I've got two boxes of shoe buttons from that factory, um, little black things. But no, they never produced very much. And then I don't know if any of you are familiar with the um, hiata of um, British Columbia, the Native American group that has button blankets and they dance in button blankets. There's one factory in Muscatine in 1989 when I was there talking to people that still receives button orders, freshwater shell button orders from the hiata to keep producing their button blankets uh, hmm. with, but that's pretty, and you know, it's now it's a real specialty market that the, the, the fashion designers that'll use a freshwater shell button because they, they're so fragile. All right, well, how many of you have uh, Baroque pearls instead of rounds? <laughs> um, hello, this is uh, Ginger. I'm on the phone. Um, yes, and I just wanted, I don't know that I necessarily have a question, Cheryl, um, but I can answer your immediate um, query about does anyone have um, Baroque pearls. I have a double strand that my sister gave me, and it's interspersed with um, gold beads really pretty and very dainty um, but the main reason why I was um, wanted to, what I wanted to primarily share with you is that my father put in a career in the Air Force and at one point during the Korean um, conflict he was stationed in Japan and when he was there and I'm doing this on ages between my sister who's older and myself he was able to go into the PX which is the um, it's a military um, department store is what it is, um, the post exchange. And he picked up a strand of a 17 inch strand strand of gra graduated Mickey Moto pearls for my mother for the most amazing price at that time of 25 us dollars. Uh -huh. My mother is now deceased and she has given her pearls to me and I cherish them. Uh huh. Yeah. And I've I've heard many many and so I, and I've been rather peripatetic <laughs> in my in my life um, traveling and all this kind of stuff and living in different spots. I now live in Boone. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, but I have shared this story with a number of jewelers. Um, also, for whatever it's worth, I also have the original um, brocade silk brocade box that my mother's Mickey Moto pearls came in. And the years that purchase would have happened would have been 19, so Catholic, 1952, 53, 54. And then I was, my, I was born in January 1955. So my dad was already back in the U.S. by then. Uh -huh. And anyway, I've ha heard a number of jewelers say that they've heard this story from a number of servicemen um, of that era over and over again. And what 
and and they were told at the base PX that the reason why Mickey Moto was dropping his price to the U.S. servicemen was so that that was a form of advertising so that when they came back to America, the yeah. demand would be um, ignited. Right. Right. You know, and when they first started culturing the pearls, um, e even with the U.S. and like with the U.S. Uh, naiads as the nucleus, um, mm -hmm. they would put those nuclei in and then let the animals sit for seven years. By 1960, they were letting the animals sit for four years. By 1982, they were letting the animals sit for about a year and a half. And so that required, you know, to get the same size pearl, the nuclei are getting bigger and bigger in order to keep that pearl size so they can harvest it more frequently. And the trouble is the pollution in the waters around Japan with all the industrial development, then the animals couldn't survive the operation. So when I was doing my research in 1988, 89, they were letting those animals sit for seven months. So when you were buying a Japanese cultured round pearl that was produced in after 1989, you were buying a US nucleus freshwater shell with you know just a couple of millimeters of um, pink tata uh, pearl oyster um, knacker lining. <laughs> and, and like I said, now that with, with the worldwide acceptance of Baroque pearls, they don't need a nucleus at all. Um, I, I need to get back and see what's happened to muscling. I could probably start with just looking at licenses that different states have issued in the 2000s to see what's happened to the muscling activity in the rivers of the Mississippi watershed. Uh, some guys still do it uh, diving. I know in Alabama, um, mussel harvesting was outlawed in 1990, and they would go out in river boats and cut a hole in the floor of the river boat and dive down to the bottom hand harvest and bring them back up through that hole. So trying to hide their uh, harvesting activity from Alabama fish and wildlife people. Well, if there are no other Can questions, I ask you a yeah. Question? yeah. When, when a jeweler looks at um, a, a pearl like the one that Ginger was describing, and then the one you just described that has, you know, very little knacker on it, what does it look like to the jeweler? Can they tell the difference, or is it is the knacker so embedded in the nuclei? I don't think you can tell the difference without. Um, there may be some. Uh, some, you, you need to ask a gymnologist this, but it could be that there's some strong light that you could hold the pearl up to a really strong light and see the union line. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly with x-rays, it would show up. Um, hmm. But no, that, I mean, they just knew I, somehow, you know, I'm being told in 1989 that, uh, you know, the pearls now are seven month long pearls. They, uh, they, they knew, mm -hmm. and they, I, I'm pretty sure that the shells are being shipped and the nuclei are being cut, were being cut in Japan. Um, so it's not, it's not that the guys here are cutting bigger and bigger nuclei so they can keep track of it that way. Um, it's it's some, somebody reporting back from the, the farms in Japan about how long the animals were surviving in the water. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, yeah. um, have, have you recorded this so it can be uh, listened to again? Well, Marilyn came in halfway through and said, Cheryl, you're not recording it. Okay. Um, so I did record it then and I don't, but I don't see the button now. It's on. It's on. Okay, so I've gotten half of it. <laughs> I've got, I probably missed all the pearling, uh, the natural pearl section and got the button and the cultured pearl section. I okay. think you've got more than half. Okay. Um, when I graduated from high school in 1969, my grandmother gave me the round 
cultured pearls as a graduation gift, which I, of course, treasure. So I have that and I have the Baroque. So it's, um, Mm. but I always felt like the Baroque were, you know, (laughs) not the good ones, you know, let's just say that, you know, so. um, Right. Well, in 89, when I entered, the first time I interviewed Latandra, he had um, two bodyguards with him in the room. And um, I asked him, I said, so what proportion of your pearl product is gonna be cultured and what proportion, I mean, are gonna be Baroques and what proportion are gonna be rounds? And he said, I won't tell you that. So, but I can, I can see now from 2020 that he's producing almost entirely Baroques. Huh. Yeah, I don't know why my phone decided to ring so much this morning, <laughs> but anyway, any other questions or comments? No, just thank you so much. There's so much information that I did not know. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yes, gonna, thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. I was going to say, in my lifetime, um, and I'm not somebody who loves to iron, so you'll understand this. <laughs> um, I have I have seen uh, probably probably blouses or shirts that I was interested in buying with a, with an in indication on their directions on there to remove the buttons the, with shell button to remove <laughs> the buttons to iron them, and there's no way I would have <laughs> <laughs> much less. <laughs> <laughs> anyway thank you thank you <laughs> okay we'll see you all next week or some other program cheryl may yeah. i say something that's totally oh, sure. unrelated to what we've done um for those of us interested in the vaccine if you go to the app Healthcare website this morning they posted a vaccine interest form Um, You go to the website, there's a a green vaccination button, and then it takes you to where you can access the form that you can fill out online and submit online. It's, it doesn't matter what category you're in, you fill out the form. And I think what they do is they, that puts you on a list and they'll let you know when you're eligible. And then from there, they'll tell you how to make an, uh, an appointment to get the, the vaccine. And that just went on this morning, so. App, Appalachian Healthcare, Appalachian uh-huh. Regional Healthcare? App, it's just apphealthcare.com. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. So we filled it out already. It just came online. So important, I think. Yeah, all right, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Bye. Hasta luego. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.